I want to welcome uh, two people who um, are just central to this, um, to this debate. Vanessa Nakate from Uganda, one of the most vocal advocates of climate justice, is here with us on stage. Welcome, Vanessa. And joining us remotely, I hope, uh, Dr. Salim ul -Huk, Director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh. Ah, I see you on the monitor, uh, Salim. Okay, I'm going to take there, my seat. Hello, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to try to do this in a hybrid form, so um, bear with us. Now, there's a lot of shorthand in this, in this whole debate. Losses, damages, mitigation, adaptation. Let's talk about what loss and damage actually is and is not, okay? So the damage part I get, that's relatively easy to quantify, right? The cost of rebuilding a bridge or a house or, or an airport. Um, loss is like how much of economic activity was lost? Antigua and Barbuda lost a lot of tourism revenues when it was wiped out, and that happens to many countries that depend on tourism. Or a farmer loses her crops because salt water is coming in to her fields. Those are her losses. But then there's like these intangible losses, you know? Um, a, a, a sense of home or a beach, a culture, can you just, beyond the, the language, can you describe, Vanessa, first of all, can you paint a picture of loss? What does that mean for you and for your community in a, in a human way? Well, um, thank you so much. There are so many ways that I can talk about loss and I can talk about damage as well. And for many people here, most of them understand you know, when we talk about mitigation, when we talk about adaptation. But when it comes to loss and damage, loss and damage is the failure of adaptation. It's a place where the climate crisis impacts people beyond, you know, what adaptation can do for those communities. So when we say there is a need for a loss and damage facility, it means that, you know, the, what the community has lost is beyond what adaptation can do. And the climate crisis is pushing so many people beyond adaptation. To give an example, some of the communities have visited in Turkana uh, in September with UNICEF. I got to meet different mothers and different children. This is a community that is being impacted by the historic drought in the Horn of Africa, which drought has left more than 30 million people with no access to food, with no access to water, with no access to life-saving health services. So when I went you know, in this community, I've always talked about how climate change is more than weather, how it's more than statistics. But when you go to a place that is directly being impacted by the climate crisis, you get to live the reality of these words. You get to understand what communities have lost. And that's why there is a need to not only talk about mitigation and adaptation, but also talk about you know, loss and damage. And loss and damage is you know, the starvation that we are seeing, the destruction of our islands, the destruction of or submerging of coastlines, and this is something that adaptation cannot help. You talked about the loss of culture. What do you mean by that? Well, for so many, you know, for so many communities, for so many people, I remember when I was starting to understand what loss and damage, you know, was, because I also didn't have a full understanding of what it was. I remember watching a video of a fellow activist, Ineza from Rwanda, and she has been doing a lot of work around loss and damage. And she explained how, you know, she, she, she was explaining in this video how she grew up in this home with her family, and she has all these childhood memories in this family, and the family has, you know, this specific attachment to where their home is. And then one day there is this, you know, flooding that washes away their home and they have to move, they have to find, you know, another place to live. And for her, that was loss and damage. 
And for many people, you know, it can be, you know, the loss of not only their islands or, you know, their coastlines, its homes, its islands, its, you know, coastlines, its things that, you know, relate to our existence. It, it's things that, you know, we carry relationships with. I remember reading an article that was explaining how to certain communities, snow is a form of culture. And, you know, they have a certain relationship with having the glaciers. But then as the climate crisis continues and they lose the glaciers, they cannot see the snow anymore. This, in the end, affects the cultures and the relationships and the, you know, the, the communities that they have built um, around their places of residence. Um, Salim, I want to pose the same question to you in the part of the world you come from. Paint a picture of what loss looks like, feels like. So, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about uh, my country, Bangladesh, which happens to be, uh, have a population of over 160 million people living in less than 150,000 square kilometers uh, and on the delta of two of the world's biggest rivers, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, that flood river. And also at the tip of the Bay of Bengal where we get cyclones coming and hitting us uh, every single year. The additional impacts of climate change is sea level rise. And the low-lying coastal zone of, this, of my country is gradually becoming more and more saline so that people are losing their livelihoods, are not being able to grow crops anymore. Even though they're trying to adapt, there is a limit to adaptation. And when you reach that limit to adaptation, people lose their livelihoods. And they then have to move. There's no other choice. Of it. They're forced to move. And right now, in the capital city of Dhaka, which is uh, the fastest growing mega city in the world, every single day, a couple of thousand people come from the coastal zone of the country by bus or by boat or by train, and they end up in a slum in Dhaka City. Right now, these are climate-induced migrants, absolutely certain. It used to be the case that they were a mix of economic migrants and environmental factors. Now, climate change impacts are by far the most visible, most credible reason why people are being forced to move from where they are. Mm. And the numbers are going to go up, unfortunately, mm. uh, because we're not doing enough to prevent it. So on Sunday, as the talks began, there was a breakthrough on loss and damage. The issue of loss and damage funding arrangement is for the first time on the agenda, on the official agenda. But it will not involve the words liability or compensation. So what does that mean exactly? If it's not going to include liability or compensation, what does it mean, Salim, to have loss and damage funding arrangements on the agenda? It's a great breakthrough, I would say, and we are very grateful to all the countries for agreeing to have this agenda item for the very first time. And the, uh, the uh, presumption that it would include uh, liability and compensation is actually wrong. We did not uh, invoke liability and compensation at all, uh, but the, the sensitivity of some countries in particular invoked them to put it into the language. What we are invoking is a sense of moral responsibility by citizens of the countries. You call them taxpayers, I call them polluters. They need to take responsibility themselves for the pollution that they are responsible for. And leaders need to take responsibility for their own country's pollution, like First Minister Nicola Sturgeon did last year in Glasgow on behalf of the country of Scotland. She took responsibility. She took, put two million pounds on the table. Since then, Denmark has done the same. The province of Wallonia in, in Belgium has done the same. We expect every leader to take responsibility and put something on the table. What needs to happen next? From your perspective, Vanessa, you've got this breakthrough, you've got this agenda item now. It's taken many years to get here. So what needs to happen next? 
Well, um, I would like to first comment on the previous question that you asked Professor Hope and, you know, about, you know, the whole thing of loss and damage being on the agenda, but then uh, eliminating the issue of responsibility and, you know, historic emissions. For me, I think that, you know, this is the West, um, you know, the global north bullying, um, <coughs> this is the global north bullying you know, developing countries into accepting the terms on which loss and damage should be discussed. And I think it's unfair. Uh, I just think it's really unjust because we know that we know who caused the climate crisis and we know who needs to hold that responsibility. So it's really important that we have loss and damage on the agenda, but it's unjust that um, we cannot hold the Western countries responsible, you know, for the climate crisis. And when you look at continents like Africa, which is responsible for less than 4% of the global emissions, and then you see the impacts of the climate crisis across Africa, across the global south, we, I mean, we, I think it's important that we hold people accountable and we, we have that, you know, in the text and you know whatever documents that they work on and in regards to what needs to come next i think that um we need to move it's important that we have it on the agenda but we also need to move beyond the agenda because for many people you know conversations you know we cannot have any more conversations we cannot have any more dialogues we need real action right now we need a finance facility to be implemented right now for the communities that are on the front lines of the crisis. Because the children, for example, in the Horn of Africa that are suffering from severe acute malnutrition, they, you know, they, they, don't, they don't have any more time for conversation or dialogue. We want to see real action. The people in Pakistan that have been you know, impacted that by the floods that left over 1,500 people dead, they, they, don't, they do not have more time for you know, dialogue. The people, for example, in, that were affected by Cyclone Idai in 2019, that left over 1,300 people dead, they don't have more time for conversation. I hope that you know, it's not another you know, kind of talk show, but um, it's something that really bathes real action. So just to be clear, the language that they agreed to, to put on the agenda, was to discuss funding arrangements for loss and damage, but not to involve issues of, quote, liability and compensation. So it doesn't say that they can't talk about responsibility. It says they cannot, they're not, the goal is not to talk about liability and compensation. Well, but what I, I hear from you is the they've been talking about this for a long time. Yeah. What needs to happen next is to set up a specific, separate funding line. Well, but I think that the language that is used is also very important because, you know, it's, um, it's one thing to discuss something, but what really gets in the official documents Many times, I think that the language matters, and I think that the language must um, must put people and justice at the center. Because mm -hmm. if it's just the discussions that have the language, but then it doesn't end in the official documents, I think um, I think that could be problematic. When you talk to um, climate activists, particularly young climate activists, what's the mood? that you're picking up this year at the conference? Well, um, I mean, for very many young activists that I am working with and, and interacting with, I think they just want you know, to see something, something positive come out of the COP. Um, I'm not going to go into what gives them hope and what doesn't, because many young people have been asked that question. And you know, for many, young people from, on, from the front lines of the climate crisis, they do not have any other choice but to have hope. Some are being asked, you know, why they
they have attended the COP while their fellow activists have not attended the COP for specific reasons. And it's really important to know that, you know, um, don't ask those questions to activists from the front lines of the climate crisis, you know, especially um, from the global south. Do not ask why we are at the COP because it's obvious why we are here. We want justice for our communities. We want um, not only a present, but a future. So, I mean, I think that it's, uh, it's very pro problematic when we are being compared with our fellow activists um, from the global north, when we are being questioned why we are here, and yet, you know, other activists are not here for specific reasons that they have given. I think, do not ask those questions to activists from the front lines of the climate crisis. Mm. Um, Salim, what is, um, what needs to happen next? In the next two weeks, approximately, um, what is necessary for this not to be a failure? Well, we expect and we hope that all parties will agree by the end of the next week uh, in Sharm el Sheikh to set up and agree to set up and establish what I will call the Sharm el Sheikh Finance Facility for Loss and Damage. If we can agree to do that, then we can still go back and work on all the details. We can't do all the details here in two weeks' time. Hmm. But we can agree to establish this and then spend the next year working on all the details and can come back in COP28 in Abu Dhabi and finalize it and make it happen. That's how things happen in the COPs. You never do something overnight in a single COP. But if we can establish the foundation and an agreement to make it happen, then we can make it happen next year. But help me understand this, okay? Because there's already money promised to help countries in the global south reduce emissions. There's money promised to help with adaptation. That money has not been delivered. So why set up another pot of money? It's a because question it's for- needed. People are suffering. You, just, you heard from Vanessa. People are dying as we speak in Nigeria. People are suffering in Pakistan. These things are happening now, today, because of human-induced climate change. And therefore, the people who are causing it have to take some responsibility to help the victims of today. These are victims who are suffering the impacts of climate change. It's not about adaptation anymore for them. It's not about mitigation anymore. Even though much mitigation and adaptation still remain relevant and important, loss and damage is now a new phenomenon that trumps mitigation and adaptation, particularly for the poorest people who are suffering the consequences. But a separate pot of money, is that the main demand? Or can you envision um, other ways to address human suffering, which is what we're talking about? Question for either of you. Is it a separate pot of money that must be committed well, to both. here? It's both, for uh, me. I, I gave you the example of uh, uh, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. She put some money on the table already. It's a separate pot. It's her money. It's the Scottish government and Scottish people's money. Denmark has put 100 million kroners on the table. That's a, a pot of money from Denmark, the government and the people. <coughs> we welcome all of those. Yeah. At the same time, here in the UN Framework Convention, we want all countries to agree to do something collectively under the framework convention at the top. And that is everybody agreeing to do something, and we expect them to agree to set up a fund for loss and damage here in, in Sharm el Sheikh. The two are not incompatible. If you want to give a dollar now from your own pocket, by all means, give it. But at the same time, we need an agreement by all countries here. This is what we do at the top. We agree together. We take a collective decision, and we are expecting that to happen here in the next few days. Can I come? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's really important for us to understand the functions of what you know the different funds are you know are doing or are going to do. When we talk about what is needed for mitigation or what is needed for adaptation or what is needed for loss and damage, yes, it is all money. It's all finance, but it all has you know different functions. 
the functions for mitigation are different from the functions of you know, adaptation and the functions of a loss and damage finance facility are also different. But the whole goal is, you know, what we are looking forward to or moving towards to is to have climate justice, you know, for the people, for the planet, for the coming generations. It's just like someone running, you know, a company. A company has, you know, a vision or a mission. But in that company, you'll find a lawyer, you'll find, you know, a, um, an accountant, you'll find, you know, a marketer, you'll find, you know, someone helping at the reception. But they all have different functions. But when their work is put together, it's towards the goal of that company or the vision of that company. So we do have one thing, we need climate justice. But to achieve climate justice, we have to respect the different functions to work towards that. The functions when it comes to finance, the functions when it comes to us individuals, that in our fight for climate justice, we are going to need activists, we are going to need lawyers, we are going to need teachers, we are going to need you know, judges, we are, we are going to need everyone involved with their specific kind of you know, function in, you know, in their own capacity, but the same goal is climate justice. So that's how I can explain the different mm -hmm. you know, funds that are needed. Yeah. The, you know, one thing we've also um, uh, seen very plainly is that the biggest emitters in the world uh, are certainly not bringing down their emissions anywhere near as fast enough as is necessary. Does this focus on loss and damage this year, um, can it have an unintended consequence, which is to distract the conversation from the need to reduce emissions? Well, um, we, again, with the activists that you know, I've worked with and organized with, Yes, we do have these demands when it comes to loss and damage, but then we cannot forget, you know, the root causes of the climate crisis. We cannot allow, you know, the same, the same countries that cause the climate crisis to continue with the same activities that cause and accelerated this crisis. And I'm starting you here from, from many of the activists saying there is, uh, we cannot have any new investments in you know, fossil fuel infrastructure, and that means coal, that means oil, and that means gas. And to talk about gas, I know there are possibly discussions of gas for Africa, but gas is a destruction um, you know, for the African continent. It won't benefit the people in Africa. These profits will end up in the pockets of people who are already rich, and we've seen that you know, the fossil fuel investments on the African continent haven't benefited the 600 million people in sub-Saharan Africa. So I think that it's important to know that as we say we need a loss and damage facility, we also need to put an end, our governments to put an end to all new fossil fuel investment. We need our governments to, you know, find a transition to renewable energy. We need them to put people and the planet and justice at the center of the conversation. So, I mean, again, the whole fight is climate justice, but we need to understand the things that will lead us there, and that is a loss and damage facility that is transition, transitioning to renewable energy while addressing the energy poverty in, in the global south and also stopping all new fossil fuel investments. So, I mean, does this, um, does this endanger um, really focusing the conversation on reducing emissions. You have countries that are supporting the calls for a loss and damage funding facility. Those same countries also want to keep extracting oil and gas. There are many such countries. How do you square that? Well, we, they have to do uh, both. In fact, I would argue that the loss and damage issue, far from being a distraction, is something that would hold the polluters accountable and therefore make them mitigate faster than they otherwise would be doing. It is really a democracy sword over them for continuing to pollute when they know they're causing harm by their pollution. And if effectively, we are going to have to 
invoke some kind of polluter pay principle, ultimately here, whether we do it within the framework convention or we do it outside in other legal arenas, which are now opening up as well. You know, ports are now becoming very active in holding to account the polluters. Polluters will not get a free ride forever, and they need to know that, and they need to be aware of that. And the loss and damage funding in the UNFCC will be one of those arenas in which we uh, hold them to account. This is one of the paradoxes, and, and perhaps China is one of um, uh, uh, the most curious examples of this. The largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions today, expanding coal not only domestically, but for the last many years. China has built many coal-fired power plants, including in Bangladesh, including have tried to in, in Kenya. So what is China's role in, in all of this? China also happens to be the biggest debtor in the world at the moment. So I'm curious, what is China's role in all of this from, from either of your perspective? Well, um, you know, China, and not just China, Europe, the United Kingdom, the United States, um, all, you know, the countries that are responsible for the climate crisis or for the rise in the global emissions, whether historically or currently, I think that they have a huge responsibility in addressing the climate crisis, and they have a huge responsibility to stop investment in all new fossil fuel infrastructure, and that is coal, oil, and gas, and support a transition to renewable energy while addressing the energy poverty in the global south. Your thoughts, Lynn? Yes, well, China has accepted responsibility to try and wean itself off fossil fuels as quickly as it can, and it is actually making very great strides. And as Mazanaka said, every single country on the planet, as part of this uh, planetary community that we all belong to, has to take its own responsibilities to reduce its emissions and dependence on fossil fuels. Most of them are doing it. They're not just doing it fast enough. They need to do it a lot faster. Should China be responsible for paying losses and damages, considering that it is currently the largest emitter? Is that on the table? At the moment, what we are asking for countries to do is to if they want to do voluntarily, but at the moment, all we're asking is for countries to take responsibility and volunteer to fund the fund. Okay. Any country that wishes to do that is most welcome to do it. We're getting um, great questions coming in from the audience. Um, can I um, ask? for the mic runners to go to the front left. Question from Mika. Front left. Mika, will you raise your hand, please, or stand up? Ah. Hi, yeah, thank you so much for talking to us, um, both of you. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of loss and damage on the cultural side, you mentioned a lot of the physical connection to landscapes. Um, an environment and getting separated from that. And I was also wondering how that ties in to um, like indigenous knowledge um, and environmental stewardship from communities that have been engaging in those practices for centuries um, and how exactly um, climate like financing and loss and damage um, facilities can help mitigate those issues and what exactly that would look like in terms of function and things like that. Um. Salim al -Huk, I don't know if you heard the question from the audience, but it was, how can we deal with cultural loss and damage? Do you want but, to take that? Yeah, um, well, I think what I can say is with loss and damage, there is the quantifiable you know, kind of loss and damage, and that, that cannot be uh, quantified. And I believe that culture is one of those things, and to just be very clear, I'm not a loss and damage expert, so I, am, I may not be saying 
how you know culture can be quantified but what i think you know it is having the communities or um, for example you've say you've talked about the indigenous communities i think that it's important for the indigenous communities to decide how that can be you know quantified because uh, i mean i or you know any other person actually who is a loss and damage finance expert i think that they don't really have a place to put money on a, you know on a community's culture or you know on a culture of a certain uh, country or continent i think that that goes back to the people in those communities and that's why again it's important to understand the roles of the different people in us addressing the issue of climate change and one of the people that you know one of the people that we need or the communities that we need it is the indigenous communities many times um, we we focus a lot on you know on the science which is very important but i think it's also important to pay attention to the indigenous wisdoms uh, from the different communities and i can you know share a, a story or something that I, I got to learn about my culture and I got to learn it recently when I was told that you know in my culture we do have clans I come from the Buganda tribe so we do have clans and I was told that uh, these clans were given one of the reasons were for wildlife conservation or wildlife protection so you find that in every clan you know, I'm from the Njobu clan, which is an elephant, so I cannot harm an elephant, I cannot eat an elephant, and so will anyone in maybe in a, another clan, which may be a tree species or a fish species or an animal species. And this was a way to preserve uh, wildlife in, uh, in our culture. So I think it's really important to have the science, to have the indigenous wisdom in our fight for climate justice. Everyone is needed. But when it comes to quantifying culture, I think it goes back to the people in those communities. Yeah. I we are trying to get um, Salim back. He, his connection dropped, and I could, I, could hear, um, I could hear it going a little wobbly there. Um, there's a question about um, question from Farah front right. Farah, can you raise your hand or stand up so the mic runner can come to you on the far right? Ah, okay. Thank you. I'm I'm Farah and I'm from Pakistan and and of course today's conversation is very very relevant to what has happened in Pakistan this year. I I I was. I was thinking um, there's been a lot of uh, conversation on loss and damage and a lot of interesting points raised here, but in the absence of any such facility to date, there, there is no loss and damage facility to date. I would really like both the speakers, especially if uh, Dr. Huck is also able to uh, come back online, to talk about who ends up bearing the cost of mm. that loss and damage. Mm. Right. Without a facility in place, who actually pays? for the losses and damages that are already going on? Well, I mean, without a facility, it is the same people that are suffering right now uh, who pays when there is no you know, facility. And you know, to hear that you, you come from Pakistan and the flooding in Pakistan and the thousands or you know, the, the over 1,500 people dying and over 33 million people being impacted because of the floods and of course you know the destruction and the economy being impacted these are people that are suffering right now but if there is no facility it is still the same people so i mean it is our you know we are in a kind of system that where the people who are bearing you know the impacts of you know, a crisis right now are most likely going to be the same people bearing another crisis mm. when it shows up. And, you know, to really give something away from loss and damage, when you look at, you know, the, the same communities that are being impacted by the climate crisis, they're the same communities that struggle to have access to vaccines when the, you know, when people, when the pandemic was happening. 
There are the same communities where girls and women are most likely not going to finish school. So it's again, it's always the same communities because the system is structured in a way that those that are already disproportionately affected will continue to be disproportionately affected by any crisis that happens. And that's why we need a finance facility and that's why we need the people on the front lines of the climate crisis, on the front pages of the newspapers, on the front seats of you know, the conversations where discussions on our planet and existence and well-being are being made. Hmm. One of the, in answer to your question, when I was researching a story about this recently, uh, an economist at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research looked at what one degree of temperature increase does to economic output, and she found that just one degree of warming has already, like according to the historical data, um, reduced the economic output of countries by two or three percent. That may not sound like a lot, but for countries that are already at high temperatures on average, these economic losses can be much, much larger, and in human terms, as Vanessa has said, um, can be really catastrophic. Um, we have been unsuccessful in getting Salim ul -Huk back online, um, and we are almost at time. So I would like to do this super scientific um, unscientific poll again of the audience um, and ask you the same two questions. Um, how many of you think today that um, rich country citizens uh, or who Salim ul -Huk referred to as polluters, historic polluters, should pay for the climate disasters that are being suffered already? And, okay, and the second question was, how many of you think that companies that are responsible for the pollution should pay? On that second question, I think maybe um, a few more hands, interestingly enough. Vanessa, just one last question to you. As you look, imagine yourself a year from now, what do you want this year's negotiations, this year's COP27, the African COP, what do you want it to be known for? Well, um, um, you know, like you say, the African COP, many people have been calling it an African COP since it was announced that it was going to happen in Egypt. And, you know, if you had asked me this question maybe before the COP, I would say one thing is to ensure that there is a representation of African activists at the COP. But now that we are already here, whereby there are still so many activists that couldn't come to the COP, I, I hope that, you know, a year from now, what we see is that, you know, our governments commit to funding no new fossil fuel infrastructure, and that is coal, and that's oil, and that's gas. I'm very careful to mention the three of them mm -hmm. because so many people are referring to gas as clean and natural, but gas is not clean. They're referring to gas as a bridge you know, for the African continent. But if gas is a bridge for Africa, it is a bridge to nowhere. What Africa needs is renewable energy and to make this you know, renewable energy distributed and it can reach the person at the very last mile. So for this scope, no new fossil fuel infrastructure, coal, oil, and gas, investment in clean energy, and while addressing the energy poverty in the global south, and a loss and damage finance facility. Thank you. Thank you so much.